I mean, here we were, these, these little kids, and, and our lawyer came, and not only was he a great lawyer, but he was a great friend and supporter to young people who really were being um, attacked and threatened just for speaking up for the First Amendment. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Corn Revere. I'm a partner at the Washington, D.C. law firm of Davis Wright Tremaine. I practice First Amendment law and am outside counsel for the Stand Up for Speech program of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. It is my great privilege to be sitting today with Mary Beth Tinker, who I like to think of as the Rosa Parks of the student free speech movement. She is a named party in the landmark case Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District that established First Amendment rights for students because of her activities uh, in protest in the Vietnam War wearing a black armband. Mary Beth, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much, Bob. Can you tell us a little bit about what led to the case? I was growing up uh, pretty much an ordinary child in Des Moines, Iowa. My father was a Methodist minister and there were six kids in our family my parents believed in putting their faith into action. And so that led them to get involved with the social gospel movement of the time. Uh, some people say that all gospel is social gospel, but for my parents, it led them to be involved with uh, the civil rights movement, fair housing, anti-discrimination issues, um, fair employment issues, and, and things like that starting with the small town where my father was a minister in Atlantic, Iowa. And so that's how we were raised with that kind of example in it. And it really had a huge effect on us, but all of us kids. You were raised with uh, that consciousness at an early age. I mean, you were 13 years old at the time. This was the mid-1960s. I was 13 in 1965. That Christmas, uh, there were about 1,000 U.S. soldiers who had been killed already in the Vietnam War. And the war was escalating, but most Americans didn't know that because most of the escalation was happening uh, really in, in secret or in private. And uh, so we didn't really know a lot about the politics of the war, us kids, uh, but then neither did most Americans. We just knew that when we looked at the TV in the evenings, we would see Walter Cronkite and uh, the newscasters with photos of these, these very powerful scenes of the war, the children running from their burning huts and soldiers in body bags and uh, the Vietnamese running and, and uh, the coffins with the flags. And it was very, very powerful for us. I felt very emotional, like, like kids do today. Yes. When they see the news. I was uh, speaking, I think, in Ohio recently and a seventh grader told me, you know, I see the news and I feel so sad but I don't know what to do about it. And that's exactly how, how I felt. There was a group called Iowans for Peace, and there was a college group and some high school kids who had gone to the first national anti-war rally in Washington, D.C. that November, the month before. And my brother John went, my sister Bonnie, who was a freshman in college then. And John was in 10th grade then. He had gone with my mother a boy named Chris Eckhart, who became another plaintiff in the case, also went to that rally with his mother. Like all kids, we were influenced very much by our family, and we were part of a group, and it wasn't just you know one or two kids getting this idea out of the blue. Yeah, so you and, and John and, and Chris Eckhart decided to wear armbands to school. Yes, and also a few other high school kids and some college kids too. You decided to wear a black armband in, in protest, or protest or mourning? The black armbands were, were for mourning the dead in Vietnam on both sides of the war. And that's what made it so controversial. If we had been, I think, supporting the troops or mourning for only the U.S. soldiers, maybe it wouldn't have been so controversial. Because of this terrible threat that students uh -huh. might mourn the dead, uh, as I understand it, the school board had a special meeting and um, decided to ban the wearing of armbands. Is that right? Yes, they heard about the plan because one of the boys at Roosevelt, I think it was Ross Peterson, wrote an article for the school newspaper. And so student journalism is very much involved in our case because they wrote not only that article, but there were several articles that they wrote for the, 
the Roosevelt student newspaper, and the principal heard about the idea, and so they had this hasty meeting of the principals and decided that it would be too controversial, and um, so they passed a rule against arm banning armbands in the Des Moines schools, and it came out in the newspaper, I think, two days before we were going to wear the armbands, so that kind of threw the wrench into our plan, <laughs> and then most of the kids on the list of 50 kids who were going to wear armband dropped off. Right, but you and your brother and, 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 and a few others decided to wear them anyway. Now, why did you do that? I think I was, first, there were two reasons. One, because I was just emotionally upset about the war. Like I said, so many kids, I'm a nurse now and I work with kids, but you know, young people have a lot of heart and a lot of emotion, and they respond to what's going on in the world around them more than adults give them credit for a lot of times. And we were very affected by what we saw in the news. And so there was that, but there was also that combined with my upbringing. My parents had come from World War II very concerned about the good people who say nothing. Yes. And allow things like Nazism to take hold. And so they really believed that you have to speak your conscience. You took a lot of flack for this, didn't you? We did get some flack. I was surprised, actually, because I thought, you know, we're, I knew I was going to break the rule, and I thought I might get suspended, but I felt that it was worth it. And also we had examples mostly from the Civil Rights Movement, because we had the Birmingham kids that we had seen on the news, and, you know, 2,000 kids there um, were arrested in 1963. When I was 10, so... Yeah. Because you went ahead and wore the black armband, you were suspended from school, right? I was suspended. After we got suspended, we tried to go to the school board and change their mind, and so this was a picture that the Des Moines Register <laughs> um, took at that time. That's my mother, and my father is here. Yeah. That's at the school board meeting when we tried to go, and, and uh, a lot of people spoke up. It was a crowded meeting. We tried to change their mind, but they wouldn't change their and mind. long story short, you ended up in court. My parents decided to go with the American Civil Liberties Union, and so they said, you know, you've got to negotiate, try to change their mind, but uh, when the school board wouldn't change their mind, they, they took it to court. But it was tough yeah. going, given yeah. the state of the law at the time, and originally you lost, right? Yes, we lost at the district level. Well, I thought we would lose the whole thing. No big important judge is going to rule that kids can break the rules. Yes. Uh, and uh -huh. then I had my math teacher, Mr. Moberly, who was the one who sent me to the office, and he was one of my favorite teachers. But I thought, there's no way you can go up against someone like Mr. Moberly. <laughs> and so I, I thought, of course, you know, us kids are going to lose. So if we lost at the district level, and then we, we lost at the appeals level. But over in Mississippi at this time, three young civil rights workers, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. And some kids wore buttons to school to protest that. And the buttons said, um, one man, one vote. And they had been suspended. So their case was working its way through the courts as well. So right around the same time that we lost our case at the appeals level at the Eighth Circuit, in the Fifth Circuit in Mississippi, those kids won their case. So this set up a circuit split. It set up a circuit split. Making it ripe for Supreme Court review. Exactly. Well, so, you even got death threats. Yeah, these people would, um, th some people started throwing red paint at our house after we wore the armor, calling us communists. My mom would always say, we're not communists, we're Methodists. <laughs> um, but they, they would, I remember a woman called me on the phone when I was about to go off to school, and she said, is this Mary Beth? And I said, yes. And she said, I'm going to kill you. And I just thought, these people are crazy. But, I mean, I knew they were out there, but it hadn't ever really hit me personally before. But this. you still felt it was important enough to keep this up? And I was surrounded by brave people giving me an example. The kids in the civil rights movement who had been attacked by the dogs. Yeah. I mean, we saw this on the news from the comfort of our living room there in Des Moines, Iowa. But we knew there were other brave people that were standing up and speaking up, including my parents and, and others. So, so the case goes to the Supreme Court. Yeah. But did you get an impression? Uh, you were talking about you couldn't believe that a 13-year-old could go up against the math teacher. Did you get the impression that you were being taken seriously by people at the highest levels of our judiciary? Yes, that was very amazing to see how not only the justices on the Supreme Court were actually arguing this case. And, you know, our lawyer 
would get up and be very lawyerly and, <laughs> uh, you know, look so serious. And I was pretty impressed that there were these adults out there that actually do stand up for kids' rights. And, I mean, one of the most important players in this was the American Civil Liberties Union. And so I've been a big fan of, the, of theirs ever since because, I mean, here we were, these, these little kids, and, and our lawyer came, and not only was he a great lawyer, but he was a great friend and supporter to young people who really were being um, attacked and threatened just for speaking up for the First Amendment. Well, and, and so in the and end, peace. You, you won this landmark case, uh, and it has, I can tell you from someone who practices First Amendment law and works with many other people who do as well, that this is one of those inspirational cases that uh, people go back to again and again to read and to draw inspiration from. And it has so many great lines, uh, like Justice Fortas writing for the uh, majority, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. This has been the unmistakable holding this court for almost 50 years. Uh, uh, do you have a favorite line from the case? One of my very favorite lines is that students are persons under our Constitution with the rights and responsibilities of persons. I love telling that to kids in the high schools and the middle schools that, guess what? You're persons. The Supreme Court has decided that you're persons because a lot of times I, I teach kids about the rights of children and the rights of teenagers and how this is in the context of that long time struggle that kids have been in for, for many, many years to gain their rights. I mean, kids used to be thought of as property of their parents. And yeah. so this was a very big deal when the Supreme Court ruled that students are persons with constitutional yeah. rights. You've continued to be active in talking to students, inspiring students, teaching them about the First Amendment. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your activities yeah. in doing that? As, as working as a nurse, I just thought, you know, maybe there's something in my experience that if I shared it with kids and started speaking with them more and more, uh, it would encourage them and inspire them. I had a lot of inspiration as a child to stand up for the things I believed in. And so I want to pass that on, and I want kids now to speak up and stand up, and so many are. I started traveling around the country a few years ago on a tinker tour, and I started meeting all of these other great organizations that are standing up for the rights of young people, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, FIRE, certainly one of them, but so many other organizations, and of course the ACLU always has. Have you also been following what's been going on in the trends on free speech on college campuses? Yes, most of my work is with the K to 12, but I also do go to quite a few colleges and law schools too and speak with a, a lot of teachers. And on the colleges, there is so much going on. So many students are speaking up about all the issues of the day, the environment, college tuition, um, racism, and of course, all of the efforts to stifle free speech on exactly. campus yeah. are very concerning. And things like the trigger warnings, I've been very concerned about. And the way that, um, you know, the, the idea of being unpopular is something that is really causing a lot of students to censor themselves, the fear of being unpopular. But um, I want to tell kids, you know, and encourage kids that popularity isn't the, the most important thing because that can change. Look how I was suspended from school in 1965. Now, last fall, I was invited back to the Des Moines schools. <laughs> they rolled out the red carpet. I have my very own locker now at Harding <laughs> Junior High School forever. That's great. So, I mean, things So history change. was on your side. Exactly. Now, how would you evaluate the work of an organization like FIRE in dealing with the atmosphere of suppressing speech on college campuses? FIRE is so important because when you speak up for something that you believe in and maybe you're not popular, you're standing up for the First Amendment, you may feel all alone. You may not know that there are others out there that can help you, that can support you. But with groups like FIRE, you have resources, you have support. And the same for the Student Press Law Center, the ACLU, other groups that are out there um, that help students to speak up and stand up. I mean, they, the NAACP. But FIRE is really important because not only are they um, standing up for students, but they have a campaign to take it to the public all over the country and let people know they're uh, 10 worst colleges and the best colleges for free speech. It's very important when a student goes to college, they want to evaluate, what's my life going to be like at that college? Am I going to be able to express myself? 
and you know, really live the Constitution instead of just studying it. Mary Beth, thank you so much for spending some time. It's been a great privilege. Thank you so much. It's really been an honor, and I wish only good things for you and also for the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Thank you. Mm -hmm.